Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to the Powering Internal API Communities webinar from SOA Software. Uh, today we have Ian Goldsmith, who is a VP of Product Management at uh, SOA Software. Uh, Ian has been with SOA Software for a long time, and he's a recognized expert on SOA and API and other digital technologies. And myself, Sachin Agarwal, uh, I'm also with SOA Software, I'm VP of Product Marketing at SOA Software. That's it. Please don't say things like Ian's been with the company for a long time. You make me sound really old. <laughs> no, no, it's just that your experience is quite valuable. All right. But all welcome, right. Ian. Thanks for, thanks for joining. And uh, a little bit about uh, APIs in general. Uh, over the last couple of years, we have seen actually a quite quite a large increased space of adoption of APIs. But a lot of the conversation about API uh, or a lot of adoption of API has been about external APIs, specifically around Facebook, Google, Twitter. These are the most talked about or the most kind of uh, evangelized kind of APIs. But we have recently seen an inflection point where in a lot of large enterprises, not only large, I think there's a lot of small enterprises who have realized the value of API programs and API first architecture, and they they have been adopting APIs internally. And uh, the topic of today's uh, uh, webinar is essentially to discuss how to create uh, or adopt uh, internal APIs internally within an enterprise. So before we start, a couple of housekeeping uh, things. Uh, there are a bunch of API and SOA resources that are available from SOA software. You can go and to, to our resource center at resource.soa.com. You'll find a lot of our webinars, our webinar recordings, uh, some white papers, data sheet, and case studies. Uh, you can also follow us on uh, the various social channels, Facebook, LinkedIn, and uh, even in the Twitter channel. There's a lot of information that we keep on posting, a lot of alerts that keep on going on over there. Uh, there are a lot of uh, your peers in the industry who are part of this, so there's a lot of interesting discussion that's going on in these social channels. So do please kind of register yourself and go to any one of these. Also, you can go to our YouTube channel. Uh, all our past recordings for uh, our webinars and other videos that we have recorded are posted out there. And the slides uh, for our webinars, including the slides for this webinar, are usually posted on SlideShare. So you can either go onto our resource center or you can go to uh, SlideShare where you can uh, access the slides for these webinars. So moving on to this topic about today's webinar, which is uh, internal API catalog, or internal API communities. So it's interchangeably used, and I, I think a lot of people kind of talk about just internal APIs, they talk about internal API communities, they're talking about internal API catalog. So can you just explain, like, what is this? I mean, what, what's an internal API catalog? What's an internal API community? Yeah, sure, I mean, um, I think the, the the, the fundamental uh, difference, I guess, between a catalog and a community is the catalog is a thing, um, like a real entity. It's something you can touch and poke and prod, whereas the community is um, is, is the group of people that engage uh, in in and around that catalog. So, um, fundamentally, the API catalog is. The, the application of API-centric technologies inside the enterprise. Now, it all gets a bit uncomfortable when we start talking about APIs and services and SOA and all these things, because there's, there's so much uh, religious debate and argument about what's a service and what's an API, et cetera, et cetera. And, and from a technology perspective, there's, there's not a great deal of difference between um, old school SOA services and modern APIs. Yeah, sure, APIs are more likely to be REST JSON and in the in the old old days SOA services were more likely to be SOAP. But that's changed quite a bit in that a lot of SOA centric services are now RESTful. And 
There are also still quite a lot of applications of SOAP services um, outside the enterprises and API. So, so kind of getting to the crux of it, when we talk about API technologies, we're really talking about the one area where SOA kind of dropped the ball and the, the API-centric view of the world has, has kind of hit a home run. Um, which is the developer engagement side of things. Um, going back to uh, to the original days of SOA, where um, service-oriented architecture was built around the sort of three pillars of SOAP, WSDL, and UDDI. UDDI was theoretically the catalog. That was the way that developers were supposed to engage with your services, and and it's just not not a a model that that really appealed to anybody. And uh, and with with this sort of external facing API and the, the treatment of an API as a product, um, you, you start focusing on things like how can I make this thing easy to consume? How can I ensure that people can use it properly with good documentation? How can I allow people to find it and use it themselves without needing a great deal of help? And so what we're talking about with an internal API catalog is taking those API portals and delivering them inside the enterprise to provide a surface area for engaging developers to really help um, accelerate the goals of SOA inside the enterprise. Um, SOA, the technology, not the company, although the two are often nicely aligned. But really, it is uh, the the way of thinking about services as APIs. So treat them as a product, ensure they're well documented, provide a self-service portal, make it easy for developers to, to come to love the things that you're providing inside the enterprise the same way you do externally. That's what we're talking about. Yep, yep, right, right. And I guess with self-service portal, you kind of mean that a developer can just go to the portal, register, and test the API himself rather than like in the older world where there, there had to be a handshake. I mean, people had to sit on a table, kind of get access to an API. It had to be provisioned manually, and somebody had to explain them how to use it, provision not only the API access, but also some of the security keys or, or cryptography. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I, I'm not... Inside the enterprise, it's it's kind of unlikely that your developers would have a registration process. They would they would typically be pre-registered because your internal portal is going to be using Active Directory or or SiteMind or whatever you use internally for for IDX, identity and access management. But in terms of requesting access to an API, that's going to be a much lighter weight, simpler process. To to sort of resurrect a very dirty word. Um, we're really talking about governance, but we're talking about um, a much lighter weight, uh, easier, more consumable form of governance that still achieves the same goals. But rather than having some kind of heavyweight process where a whole bunch of people have to weigh in and approve access for an application to something, you get a lightweight, easily accessed, self-provisioned and self-initiated process driven through the portal. Okay. Well, that sounds good. So. You know, like, what is leading to this adoption of APIs in, in the new sense? I mean, obviously, it's, it's, it has a lot of ramifications, and it's quite similar to so. But what, what's leading to this new kind of uh, why, why enterprises need API communities or API catalogs? What's leading to, the, to this adoption? Well, um, I mean, yeah, we can we can sort of look at the the things that are changing inside the enterprise. And, and I mean, it, it comes back to the same themes, the same messages that have been around forever. IT is being asked to do more with less. Um, and there are, there are big picture projects and programs that, that IT organizations are being asked to, to drive. Um, digital transformation is a, a phrase that gets bandied around a lot. Um, but it's kind of important, right? How do you... How do you make sure that your business remains relevant in the modern world? Um, and so uh, a lot of that is, is enabled through uh, the delivery of external APIs, which in turn have to, um, have to rely on internal services or internal APIs. Um, really, when, where the, sort of the, the, the sweet spot around 
internal API catalogs is really it's really this middle bullet point. It's it's reuse of assets. Which yeah, sure, reuse is an old word. It it comes back from the the depths of, of SOA. The original goal of SOA was to enable reuse, to allow you to build applications faster and more easily uh, because you already have a bunch of capabilities that exist. Um, the problems that, that we faced with SOA, and I think we get onto a bit more of this, were, were really around that that even though you could create reusable assets, it wasn't all that easy to allow developers to find them and use them. So by treating them as APIs, by um, documenting them, publishing them in an internal portal, and, and dealing with uh, treating them in the way that you think of external APIs, you, you really enable reuse. And then you've got a kind of, kind of a third aspect, which is more and more of the technology that we use in the enterprise is moving outside the enterprise. We're using cloud services to do more, to, to, to drive more and more of the critical aspects of our business. And it's important that we're able to control that. Um, so if a develop, developer is going to build an application inside the enterprise, but that application relies on functionality that's delivered externally, you'd better make sure that you understand how that external functionality is being used, what kind of data is stored externally, is pulled in internally, are you complying with regulations, um, are you confident in your security, are you confident that the external service isn't going to bring your internal service down. So um, using your internal API portal to provide a surface area for externally provided services is, uh, is a really important aspect of this technology as well. Um, right, so right, and one of the things that I've about seen with uh, even consumption of external services internally is sometimes these are build services, and a lot of developers individually have individual demands of consuming these services, and they might be individually swiping their credit cards to use the same service, whereas if you, I guess, post it on an internal API catalog and use one kind of enterprise uh, enabled provisioning where only you provision or, or get that access for the whole enterprise, using a single credit card swipe and then kind of provision it out to internal developers. That that, uh, that also seems to be kind of an emerging use case. <laughs> like, are you seeing that yet? Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think that's a there are a bunch of different scenarios where that's that's really valid. I mean, take the case where you sort of minimum access to minimum access level to an API is uh, we'll pick a number a thousand requests a month maybe, and so you. You pay your 20 bucks on your credit card for that, and then another 50 developers do the same thing. All of a sudden, you're starting to look at significant costs coming from this consumption, whereas, in fact, that 1,000 transactions a month may be more than enough for every single developer in the enterprise. So absolutely, aggregating that, um, that kind of consumption model into a single central realm is, is really pretty important, as long as the license agreement for the external API permits that, of course. You've got to be a bit careful with some of these things. Yep, yep. And again, I, I think, I mean, like you said, I mean, governance seems to be a dirty word, but it's still the same thing, whether you use governance or control. And this is probably governance of your external services along with governance of your internal services. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but the word, the word governance definitely has um, got a bit of a bad rap, but it's, it, it doesn't make it any less important. So you did mention a little bit about SOA, and like when you mentioned reuse, you mentioned UDDI. So, so a lot of this about reuse, governance, th these were the same kind of promises or the messages that were around with SOA. So, so, so can you like comment a little bit about what worked at SOA and what didn't? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, SOA is a, an architectural principle. Um, uh, I mean, service-oriented architecture, the way of building applications um, using services. And, um, and and that hasn't changed. API, uh, an API-centric technology is fundamentally SOA in, in one form or another. Um, the, the goal behind uh, the original concept of, of SOA was to build applications faster and for less money um, to 
minimize uh, sort of risk of transcription errors. You want single source of truth for information. You don't want to have multiple different uh, customer databases, for example. You want a single consolidated system that delivers all of these things. I mean, there, are, there are classic examples around reuse. You think about um, a large financial services company um, with a whole bunch of different lines of business all conducting transactions in lots of different countries. All of those applications will have some kind of requirement for uh, foreign exchange information. So uh, does it make sense to build Forex capabilities into every single application, or should you provide a centralized Forex service that all of those applications use? That's kind of the, the goal. Um, and despite the, the sort of bad rap and, and comments like uh, Burton, or I guess she was with Burton at that time, and Thomas Main saying things like SOA is dead. And by the way, the second half of what she said was SOA is dead, long live SOA, but of course that kind of got dropped a bit. But despite those, those kind of comments, a lot of organizations have, have seen a great deal of success with SOA and have, have got uh, real business value derived from it and have been able to do a lot of things they wouldn't have otherwise been able to do. But at the same time, there have been quite a lot of challenges. A lot of organizations have, have struggled with um, SOA. They've struggled with adoption um, of services. They've struggled to control the services they build and have ended up building a ton of different services that really all do the same thing, essentially just defeating the object. And, and really what that comes down to is a, a failure to govern your platform effectively, a failure to, to govern the services you're building and a failure to govern the consumption models. Um, and so while SOA has been successful for some, it's also um, not worked all that well for others. Right, right. And one of the biggest misconceptions that I have seen around SOA is, like you mentioned, I mean, SOA is service-oriented architecture. That's kind of a methodology. It's an architecture. And often, SOA is directly related or people kind of just kind of related to SOAP as a protocol and not with the architecture. And I think that's a big misconception that has been floating around with some people and some of the recent kind of new uh, propeller heads like our CTO like to call them uh, who, who just uh, come up with new technologies and, and try to make things that have worked kind of just make them look bad. Yeah, I mean, um, um, the, the first bullet point on this slide was SOA built using UDDI registries, WSDL, and so well, no, not necessarily. Um, I think the original concept of SOA, um, really the original idea of web services, were that web services were sort of that that triumvirate of technologies, um, but that's really changed. And in fact, as an architectural concept, SOA predates web services by by quite some margin. Um, and and so we certainly, um, from a pure technology perspective, uh, the the companies that we work with have been using things other than SOAP and WSDL for for many many years. There's a lot of uh, a lot of people are doing simple things like um, a plain old XML over JMS, or more uh, more commonly these days JSON documents over AMQP. Uh, for, for reliable messaging. There, there's obviously a lot of soap for, for messaging, but there's, there's a great deal of straight out uh, HTTP, uh, plain old XML over HTTP, XML RPC, um, and, and increasingly uh, REST JSON services uh, implemented over HTTP as well. But bottom line is that there's really no fixed technology set that underpins the idea of SOA. Yeah, and that probably applies to APIs as well. I mean, the, major, the mass kind of opinion right now is that API is associated with the REST, and AP, REST and JSON, but I guess the, the core methodologies and the reason why APIs are becoming so successful and adopted so widely is, is a little more than just the protocol. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, like, what really is the promise of the APIs? Yeah, well, um, <laughs> there, there, there are two, two really different sides to that, right? Um, the diagram on this slide sort of really gets to the, the business rationale behind it. You, 
when you think about an API, you're really thinking about um, an expression of the value your business brings and expressing that value in a way that's consumable across the diverse set of ways that people want to access that data or access that, that business service. Um, and, and the reason why uh, APIs like Netflix and Facebook have been talked about more than many others is because they really are sort of the poster children for, for the success that APIs can bring. Um, and Netflix is obviously a great example in that their API really was responsible for fundamentally changing the nature of their business. Um, and I'm certainly not suggesting that um, if you work at a large bank, you should expect publishing an API to suddenly turn you into a, a dog food vendor. You know, it's not that's that's not not your your goal. But but the API really does, from an external perspective, allow you to deliver your business capability um, through a huge range of different channels. And then you think about the same thing inside the enterprise. Um, and on a smaller scale, an API represents a piece of business capability exposed by an application that now needs to be consumed not just by another application or a user's web browser, but across a huge range of different devices. And you want that API to, uh, to be readily available and accessible and usable by the people that are building the applications that run across all these different devices. So even something as um, seemingly uh, well, simple, maybe the wrong word, but some, so an, an example of, of maybe an oil company that wants uh, to provide a, a sort of a virtual, uh, a, a virtual oil field environment. So an oil worker can walk into a refinery or an oil field and see a pump leaking and can kind of point their phone at the pump and basically say, what's that? And then through a series of API calls for location information for um, asset databases, the the application running on the phone can say, oh, well, that's pump X, Y, Z, um, and do you want to raise a trouble ticket? And then through another API, you can raise that trouble ticket. Those will all be internal APIs that represent pieces of business capability that, that, are, that derive greater value. Now, on the left-hand side of, the, of the, the slide here, we have four basic um, statements about things that, uh, that AP, it, ways in which APIs differ from the, the way that we've thought about SOA services in the past. Uh, I mean, most of it is about making the API usable. So allowing developers to find it, which drives greater adoption, allowing them to readily request access to it, which is um, a much easier access model rather than the heavyweight governance process. Providing accurate and well-written, well-consumable documentation. Um, and, and so just on the note of documentation, well, a couple of interesting things around. In the, in the good old days of, of SOAP services, the, the service documentation was the WSDL. Now, OK, great. That defines your interface, it defines the way you access the service, i.e. the bindings, it defines where it is, the, the endpoints and access points, it defines any policies through policy assertion, but it really doesn't give you instructions on how to use it and give you any kind of information about what's going on under the covers. Now, APIs, on the other hand, tend to be the other way around. They tend to have good documentation that describes what they do, but sometimes they're a little bit lacking in the technical description of the interface itself. And so that's an area where um, the, the application of an internal API catalog that's well-structured provides declarative, dynamically generated documentation that is then augmented by the API developers to provide a really rich experience for, for the app consumers. Um, but rolled into all of this is the fact that the, these excessive use of APIs can really end up getting you in trouble. You can, you can have, you can basically lack control over your API environment. And that's where we kind of get back to the, some of the basic ideas of governance. It's important that we are able to, um, to control which APIs we're publishing into the catalog and control the quality of those APIs. It's important that we're able to provide easy access controls over who and what is allowed to access which API. 
And you also have to be careful not to become a victim of your own success. You need to make sure that your APIs uh, and the apps that are consuming them comply with policies that protect the back-end systems that surface those APIs. So you need to, to add uh, quota controls and effective security and all of these kind of things to your APIs as you go. Right, right, right. So, so Ian, you started talking about, like, which is like how do you make internal APIs kind of work within enterprises. Before that, I, we have a lot of questions coming up, so I just wanted to make a point, which is uh, we will open it up for Q&A towards the end, but if you have a question, please feel uh, free to type it on the chat window, and uh, we'll address them towards the end. Uh, so, so coming back, Ian, I mean, so, so you started talking about some of the best practices. So when you talk about enterprises uh, and they kind of rolling out internal API programs, can you talk about like what are some of the best practices that they should uh, kind of undertake? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we I, I tend to like to think of things in, in sets of three because that's about, um, about as much as my adult brain can cope with. So the three main things to focus on in, in ensuring that you're successful with an internal API community, publish the right APIs. Um, make sure the APIs you have are uh, behaving the way you want them to behave and then make sure that they're easy to find and consume. So, so coming back over those, publishing the right APIs, make sure that the APIs you're putting into your catalog are things that people really need. Make sure that they are built correctly, that they're designed right, that they are built in such a way that they will continue to meet the needs of the consumers for, for, for quite some time. And then ensure that they're reusable. That last one sounds pretty basic, because surely any API you publish is reusable. Well, yes, if you're thinking about the idea of an external API that's put out there in order to satisfy app developers building anything they care to think about. But one of the pitfalls, one of the things that, 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 bif that, that kind of caused issues for, for companies adopting SOA is that people took uh, a piece of application functionality and surfaced it as a service so that their application could use it, but it really wasn't of any value or any use to any application externally. So again, step one, make sure you're publishing the right APIs, build the right things. Um, you've got to make sure that the things that you're building are easily consumable. So make sure that people can find them easily. And the old days of sort of structured search and browsing through taxonomies and category structures, that, that, that's, that's history. Everyone's familiar with Google and free text search and typing something and expecting to get the right answer. So make sure that you have a well-indexed catalog that people can find things the way they want to find them. Um, even to the extent of I'm developing something and I run into uh, a Java exception as I'm trying to consume this thing, and I can't figure out why. So the immediate programming model today is I take that, I copy that exception, I paste it into the Google window, and sure enough, up pops someone else who's run into the same problem, and someone shows me how they've addressed it. You need to make sure that your discussion forums are indexed, so you have all of those kind of things ready and available for you. Make sure that the APIs you're publishing are not just documented, but they're well documented. Documentation is everything when it comes to APIs. So your documentation should be interactive. You should be able to uh, send test requests from the documentation. You should be able to see the structure of the API, the methods, the parameters, any sample request and response. That should all be built into your API documentation to make it really easy for someone to use it without having to, to send you emails or ask you questions. And all of that is part of self-provisioning. Make sure that developers who are requesting access can find an easy button somewhere that says, oh, I want to use it, request access. In, uh, in the external API realm, people talk about API keys. Um, we actually think that developers' apps have keys, and you can request access for your key to multiple different APIs and manage it in that way. But same, same basic concept. And then finally, you have to make sure that the APIs you have out there are reliable, they perform properly and they're secure, i.e. that they're behaving correctly. So um, by behaving correctly, we mean make sure that the API endpoint itself is available. It performs the way you want it to perform. You're not leaking data through it. Um, you're complying with regulatory concerns and all of those kind of things. And fundamentally, 
the things required, these three main steps to, to make an internal API community work, fundamentally that's governance. Like the word or not, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think it is governance. It's, it's whether you call it governance or whether you call it control or whether you call it anything else, I guess it's, uh, it's very important that you have some lightweight, agile governance in place. And one of the things that I've seen with, uh, at least with SOA, I mean, if you look at inter enterprise, uh, within the enterprise, I mean, there are a lot of skunk work projects that are going on, whether they are valid or not. I mean, that's the nature of an enterprise. A lot of people create APIs, whether they're for their own personal use or within the line of business or maybe sometimes across line of business. But a lot of those get created, and, and registry at times became kind of a dumping ground for all these APIs, whether, whether they were just used for kind of one person or maybe just five, a group of five or maybe enterprise like use. So, so there is some level of governance and also kind of in terms of which API can be used within the line of business or across line of business. So there's some level of kind of, I guess when you're talking about internal APIs, there, there's, there's some kind of more heightened visibility or security controls that are needed. So. Uh, so what are the best practices in terms of kind of publishing the APIs or, or like you should say, like uh, publishing the right APIs? Um, well, there's a few things. Um, I mean, the, the, it's sort of about the, the, the goals, the things you're trying to achieve. You're, you're trying to uh, make yourself as an IT organization more responsive to business needs. So... Um, by exposing fundamental capabilities from your applications and your infrastructure and exposing them as APIs, you allow people to do things more quickly, which in turn can help you be better aligned with, uh, with the business. And certainly over the last few years, we've kind of seen a, a growing tension between uh, business and IT as IT is often seen as, as slowing down the business and, and uh, preventing the business from doing things it wants to do. Um, and oftentimes, the business will kind of go drive a, a project outside the aegis of IT and then run into problems with data leakage or, or lack of reliability. And so these, these problems get handed back into the realm of IT. So it's really important for the IT organization to be able to stay on top of these things. Um, as part of, the part of making sure that you are publishing the right APIs, you need to be able to manage um, the DevOps process. So as I build something, how do I roll it into production? How do I version things effectively? How do I ensure that what I have published and running is always up to date um, without risking uh, backward compatibility issues for, for the consumers that are actually using it? How do I know who's using things so that if I am going to make a breaking change, I can notify them and inform them? Um, how do I automate the provisioning of both APIs and apps um, so that there isn't a huge burden uh, on me as an organization for, for publishing and exposing these things? Um, and, and, and then sort of as, as part of all of that process, how do I visualize what's happening and see who's consuming what and where and how, um, view the relationship between uh, a data element and a data model and the, the applications that are consuming those or, or leveraging them and the services they're exposing and the APIs that are built using those services, the apps that are then consuming those APIs. So there, there's a great deal of, um, of information that you really need to collect around the use of APIs in order to ensure that you are um, providing uh, a, a good, reliable environment for your your business use of APIs. Right, right. And I guess one of the important steps, at least the one that appeals to me really uh, on publishing the right API is not only like choosing the right API, but like you mentioned, I mean, documentation is one of the biggest and most important aspect of APIs. So putting in control and approving an API and publishing it to a portal and making sure that once it's published or before it's published, the right documentation, the right level of the documentation, complete documentation is in place before you do it. I mean, and that's probably one of the 
So you have the bottlenecks that repositories or registries had. I mean, they had all the interface, well-defined interface definitions with little or no documentation. Yeah, no, that's very true. Um, so very, very true. So as, as part of this, I mean, so, so once the APIs get published, uh, and uh, obviously uh, through this controlled process and lightweight governance process that you put in place where you select the right APIs and then get the right documentation and then publish them to the portal. But how do you ensure that the right APIs are being accessed by the right individual or the right line of business? And also, I mean, uh, the external APIs get a lot of funding. I mean, and they're def definite DevOps and making sure that the lights and the bulbs are on. So, But how do you ensure kind of the reliability and security and uh, how important are they within the internal aspect, uh, internal API aspect? Well, I mean, a lot of that's where a gateway comes in. Um, you you really need uh, a, an SOA management tool in, in the SOA realm to help ensure reliability and security, um, depending on the platform that you're using. Um, so, for example, the Microsoft stack actually has pretty good built-in security capabilities if you're willing to configure it yourself. Really not much monitoring built into there. But most of the other core service stacks don't have any kind of built-in security or monitoring or, or any of that sort of stuff. So even in, in internal SOA, SOA management, SOA monitoring is important. But in the API realm, it becomes really important where you there's a degree of remove between you and your consumer that doesn't really exist in internal SOA. You don't necessarily know in the API realm who is going to be consuming your service. You certainly should know who actually is consuming it because you should have an API management platform in place that allows you to control how much of your service they're using, control what data you're exposing and surfacing um, and, and ensure that you're delivering the kind of quality of service you, ex you, you need to deliver to them. And all of that capability is really provided through a gateway. Um, and the, the gateway delivers a, a, a lot of features. I think we have a slide that talks a bit more about gateways, so I'm not going to dwell on it too much here. But yeah, ensuring reliability and security, you need a gateway. Yep, yep, yep. And, and finally, I mean, can you talk about a little bit about developer engagement? You started talking about how, like, the hierarchical model is not kind of fit uh, for consumption. You need the Google-based search index or something similar for internal adoption of APIs. So can, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, um, it, it gets quite interesting. We've had quite a few conversations with, with large enterprises about this recently. Um, Sort of the questions that come up are things like, well, how do I have a catalog of services that are only that, that where a developer in a particular business unit or a particular project can find things that only apply to their project, um, but someone outside their department can't find things that apply to the project? And there are a couple of different answers to that. One is uh, a, a well-executed API catalog will have the kind of group management functionality that allows you to expose certain APIs only to certain groups and, and manage things in that way. Um, the second answer is, well, maybe you should be thinking about APIs a little bit differently and you should ensure that things that are in your central API catalog are really um, the things that are applicable across the enterprise. Both views are valid and it's important that you have the technology in place to, to, to meet those needs. What's really changed with, in the last, I don't know, 10 years or so, is that the idea that someone would browse through a tree structure to find something based on uh, categories or, or business capability, that, that's kind of gone by the wayside. We're all too impatient for that. We're, we're a Google-driven world, so we expect to be able to type in a couple of keywords or really natural language and find the things we're looking for. So having a, a, a real search index that is live and is is constantly updated for all of the information about your API. So the documentation, the, the surface metadata, so name, description, etc. Uh, content on discussion forums, um, all of the trouble tickets, all of those kinds of things should be <coughs> indexed in real time. 
to make it very easy for you to find the information that you're looking for, not just the APIs, but information about the APIs and getting help and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so, so that search index is a fundamental part of, um, of driving developer engagement around the API. And this is actually an area where it's a little bit different inside the enterprise from your external API. And probably the biggest difference between the internal catalog and the external portal is that the external portal is probably only going to have one or two or three different APIs for a really big company. You're, you're publishing a small amount of, of data or a, a, a small number of APIs that deliver your macro business capability. Whereas in an internal catalog, you might have tens or hundreds or maybe even a few hundred APIs that deliver lots of different, more granular business capabilities. So having that indexable search capability becomes really, really important. Um, and then the other things that, that are key in developer engagement, I've kind of beaten the documentation horse. It's, it really is all about making sure that you have a well-documented API and that your documentation is structured correctly and, and that it's built right, um, that people can use it. Uh, group support to ensure security controls for, so that partner X can see this and partner Y can see that, but they can't see each other and, and you control and constrain views. And I'm using the term partner because that's where this technology is normally applied, but it's equally applicable inside the enterprise to departments and projects and groups. Um, the ability for people to, for, for developers to test their apps and send test requests to APIs from within the portal. Again, that's all part of engaging the developer. And then finally, making sure this thing's social, ensuring that developers can interact with each other. They can interact in real time with API administrators. They can post questions. They can get responses. They can even interact through um, social media platforms uh, if they want to. You can. Uh, like your API or your app uh, on Facebook. Uh, you can tweet about things from, from within the platform. Those, those are all important capabilities. Right, right. So, so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm kind of looking at the chat window as well. So we're getting a lot of questions around, and that kind of brings up to the next topic also we had, which is what does this uh, API platform uh, for internal API adoption looks like? Like, what are kind of the key components or the key layers of this uh, internal API platform? Yeah, um, so we, so I'm going to go through this really quickly because I'm aware that we're getting a bit short on time, but from the bottom up, um, part of your API platform or API catalog is is a life cycle layer ensuring that you're building the right things and that you're building them right. And that really is sort of the underpinning of, of governance. On top of that, you have a service integration layer. In the enterprise, in, in core SOA, that's often um, partly delivered by an ESB, but ESBs are more sort of application integration. So service integration is a bit more declarative. Uh, lightweight micro-orchestration for constructing APIs from existing back-end services, those kind of things. On top of the, the APIs or services that you construct through your integration layer, you have gateway capabilities. And the gateway is all about um, security, reliability, uh, monitoring, performance, so things like antivirus, um, denial of service attack prevention, uh, enforcing authentication authorization policies. Those kind of things are all delivered by the, the, the gateway. Um, so the gateway, really, the top level of the gateway is where you surface your APIs for internal or external consumption. Um, and those are the APIs that you expose through your developer engagement platform or through your portal. And we kind of covered that on the last slide. But that's, that's the catalog, effectively. And then on top of all of that is an analytics layer that helps you understand what's happening um, with the APIs that you're exposing, who's using them, how much, slicing and dicing both operational information about the API, but also increasingly looking at the business value that the APIs are delivering. Um, how many of X widget did I drive, did I sell through this API in the last month? Um, how much value did the API deliver me in this area? So looking at business metrics and analytics in that way is a, a key part of the API platform. Right, right, right. So I'll, uh, with this, I mean, I'll, I'll come to, uh, to the last question that I have for you, which is uh, we, I mean, at SOA Software, 
we have over 200 or 300 like enterprise customers, uh, both uh, like the customers who have deployed SOA, uh, a lot of them have been successful and uh, some have not been. And similarly, like we are seeing with APIs, not every customer who is deploying API uh, will be successful. So what are some of the common pitfalls that you have experienced that customers should be kind of careful in terms of when they are taking this API journey? Yeah, I mean, um, that's, that's a good question. The, so it's things to avoid are, are things like getting locked into a particular platform. Um, so don't build all your APIs on, um, on Oracle or on IBM or using Node. You've got to expect to have lots of different developers building things in different ways. Um, and you want to make sure that you have a management platform that's separate from the platform that you're using, platforms that you're using to build your APIs. So if you do a lot of development in WebSphere, it might be tempting to take, uh, to, to pick up an IBM API management solution. But what you'll find is that that solution only works well with APIs built using the IBM, I, I, the, the IBM technologies. Um, and that's not really going to work for you. So separation of concerns between your API management platform and the platform that you use to build APIs is really important. Um, make sure that the platform that you're using to surface and manage APIs can handle more than one protocol. You don't want something that is um, SOAP only, although that really doesn't exist in the API realm these days. Um, you want to make sure that you're not stuck with something that can only handle JSON or can only handle RESTful services. You want an API management platform that can deal with whatever you throw at it, whether it's um, XML over AMQP or JSON over HTTP or SOAP over HTTPS or SOAP over JMS. You need to be able to handle all of these different protocols in one platform so you get a single consistent view of it. Um, I know this is something we talk about a lot, but make sure that you have a good lifecycle management platform and that you really are managing some form of governance Governance in the modern world is a little different than it used to be. It's a much lighter weight process that's often integrated with your other capabilities and your other, your other applications. But make sure that you are governing what you're doing. Make sure you know what services and APIs you're publishing and that you know who's consuming them and how they're consuming them. Or you'll find that you start making changes to things and you get mission critical customer relationships failing and struggling. Um, and then also in the API management realm, as you start moving APIs internally, and, and even with external platforms, it's really important that you don't reinvent the wheel with the things you already have in the enterprise. You need to make sure you integrate with your uh, identity access management infrastructure. If you're a SiteMinder customer, use SiteMinder for your API portal and to authenticate your API traffic. Uh, make sure that you're integrating your monitoring with your security event management systems and your uh, your enterprise monitoring platforms. Um, you integrate with your source control systems so that as people develop things, you have visibility into what's changing and what may change and affect an API. Um, it's likely that you've got a lot of investment in existing enterprise databases. Use it. You don't need a new database or a new set of databases deployed at the edge of your network to try to provide a framework for managing your APIs. Use what you've already got and use the, the, the technologies you've invested in already. So people that kind of don't follow these paths end up going down the track with an API management vendor and then sort of a year in realize that they may have made a mistake and start looking elsewhere. We, we see quite a bit of that. Yep, yep. I, and I, I think you, I mean, this is a very important aspect, both about platform lock-in and as well not integrating with enterprise infrastructure. I mean, we... We see, I mean, obviously reuse whatever is there. I mean, your security system, if you have an analytics platform, then an API management platform should have the capability of collecting every information that is going through the API. But if you want to use an external analytics platform that you have something from maybe Splunk or Tableau or one of the larger vendors like Oracle, IBM, Cognos, or something else, then you should be able to hook up to those as well and uh, not kind of take point products or logged in products into an API management and have one off for, for these capabilities built into the API management platform. I, I, I think that's a very important one. 
Yep. So, thanks, Ian. Uh, uh, thanks for this uh, great overview. So, uh, I, th I think uh, towards the end of, uh, we're running out of time, so uh, I'll open up for Q&A. But before I open up for Q&A, again, like I would like to point to everyone, uh, there are a lot of resources with respect to API and SOA uh, in our resource center, as well as follow us on uh, our social channels. And uh, with this, uh, thanks Ian, and let's open it up for uh, Q&A. So I already have a bunch of questions that have uh, come in. Let me start taking them one at a time. So the first one is, uh, so if an organization has gotten by with no SOA management platform so far, then why would they need an API management platform, assuming they are using exposing APIs now? It is simply that with APIs, you are commonly exposing them as unknown entities. So I guess uh, I guess the question is about if you haven't, if you don't have any SOA management platform, if you have no SOA, then uh, why would you need an API management platform? Yeah, well, I think he, I, I actually think he's saying if, if we've got successful SOA without SOA management, then why do we need API management? Um, and I think um, I, I think it is a question of, of control. Um, as you look at there's a there's typically uh, SOA talked about loose coupling, the, the loose coupling of an application and a service. Um, but in reality, because of the lack of self-service developer engagement, the coupling was never really that loose. You generally had a pretty good idea of who was using things and how they were using them. So. What we're seeing with uh, with APIs is you don't have that same degree of control and visibility. So you need an API management platform to add that. You need to know that an application can't bring down your back-end services by sending too much traffic or sending malicious content. You have to be able to control that, and that's part of the realm of the API management platform. But also, um, I kind of... Uh, I, I wonder how successful you've been with SOA without some kind of management in play, because bear in mind that really we're not just talking about operational management here. We're really focusing on the ideas of um, developer engagement and um, driving adoption of APIs and services, as opposed to exposing something that's used by one or maybe two applications internally. Right. So one other question that's a little related uh, to, to, again, governance. So can today's governance be best enabled and sustained through an architect community quality rating and feedback on design completeness? So if so, what tool would make the API catalog an asset of the community? Um, well, so... I guess more about, like, how does the API catalog play in kind of the whole governance aspect of approval of APIs and life cycle? How, how does the API catalog and... Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think it, it kind of gets to the way governance is changing. So governance really isn't about uh, a monolithic application that you use. It's not about a giant repository that you shove things through a, a sort of a, a, a sausage-making machine. You know, you don't push one thing in at the beginning, you get something out at the end after a long-running process. Governance is enabled through APIs. So you submit a request to uh, access an asset through the developer tool that you're using. And um, that initiates a chain of governance activities that sort of happen in the background, and then your application gets notified, oh, yeah, your request's been approved, or, hey, I need more information from you. So um, we're, we're sort of focusing on the idea of, of lifecycle services and governance um, being delivered as an API. Um, and, and therefore integrating that governance or lifecycle API with things like the API catalog so that you get the right amount of governance at the right time in the way that your developers can consume it. Right, right, right. So I, I, I think that's, that's very important. I mean, so the, the thing is that governance is required. I mean, it's, it's probably more important 
given the dynamic nature of enterprise, which is a lot more services, there are services not only on-premise, they're, they're in the cloud, uh, but you need a lighter weight, kind of an API-led approach for governance, and I, I guess to your point, I mean, that that's the lighter weight governance that you need to take. Uh, a couple of more questions. I think we have time for two more. Uh, so there's a bunch of questions around kind of data power in general, which is the first one is uh, uh, like what are the different kind of uh, gateway platforms that you support? And I think to it, like we have our own API gateway that's uh, platform agnostic, heterogeneous platform, but that in, then at the same time, I mean, there are a bunch of questions around data power, which is does SOA software API management support data power as a gateway? And... Uh, uh, a related question to that is, uh, can you show a typical deployment architecture using your product and data power? Um, answer to the first question is yes, we support data power as a gateway. So we have our own gateway, which is a, essentially a software appliance. Um, and we can also leverage data power, essentially making data power participate as the API gateway in your, in your API catalog or API management platform. Um, as for an architecture diagram, there's there's lots of them out there on our website, and, and we're happy to point you in the right direction for those. Right, right. If you go to a resource center, you'll find specifically a lot of webinars around data power and deployment architectures around uh, data power and our API management platform. And with this, I'll just uh, take the last question as we are coming to the top of the hour. Uh, any best practices or guidelines uh, that will help you to know if your documentation is good enough, which is essentially, I, I think the question is, when do you decide your documentation or what's the guideline on API documentation and when do you publish them to the portal? Well, I mean, the cynic in me says that any documentation is better than what's existed in the past. Um, so there's a sort of simple uh, governance flag around documentation, which is, is it present? Um, that's sort of step one, so do you have any? Um, but that, that's obviously being a little facetious. I think the, um, is it good enough is a question of review. Who's reviewing it? How are you reviewing it? If you are publishing a, a API as a product, think from a product manager's perspective. How would you review the product documentation? How would you make sure that you deem that product documentation accurate? And, and you probably want focus groups and peer review. There are services like Topcoder um, that provide the ability to run competitions around documentation review and even documentation writing. <coughs> um, in terms of uh, guidelines and best practices, that's more of a, I guess, more of a professional services activity. There's not a lot that a product can do to help you know that it's good enough other than provide a really good framework for building correct documentation and dynamically build interactive documentation for you that simply requires annotation. And we, we do quite a lot of that. Right. So thanks, Ian. Uh, I think with this, uh, we will come to an end. Uh, there are a bunch of other questions. So what what we'll do with all the other questions is we'll, uh, we'll take a note of those and probably do a blog post on the rest of the questions. Uh, also, if you have something specific, uh, do send the question at uh, either info at SOA.com, just email it to us, or tweet it to us at SOA Software Inc. And again, thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining. And uh, thanks, Ian, for, uh, for joining us for this webinar and providing us uh, this information on internal API communities.